Good morning, everybody. Today, we get to hear from one of the highest profiting individual traders in the entire U.S. stock market. We'll dive into the mind of brilliance and extract all of the amazing knowledge that I know he does have to offer. So without further ado, brought to you by the United Traders, I'm your host, Jake the Incubator, and you're listening to Collective Minds. The day is the 24th of September, and we're coming to you live from the United Trader Studio. As always, it's great to have you all. So I'd just like to start off today by bringing in our main guest. He is somebody that I have been lucky uh, to have come to know over the last year, and he's my mentor, friend, regular game night opponent. His long list of achievements has led him to where he is today, a 16-year veteran investor and a serious force to be reckoned with. I'd like to introduce TJ. Good morning, TJ. So glad to have you on the show. Good morning, Jake. Glad to be on. And uh, I'm not sure about the best in America, but thank you for that great introduction. So I already know you pretty well, but our listeners might not. So tell them a little bit about yourself. All right. So um, my background is in finance. I was kind of groomed for this line of work. Um, my dad was a business owner. Um, investor and he was really intelligent he's one of those jack of all trades type of guys and uh, my mom put me into like a really good private school so i really focused on economics accounting and commerce because biology was just beyond my level of competence at that time and uh, still is to be honest and uh, throughout my o levels and a levels that's what i really focused on so when it came time to college it's like okay what am i gonna do well there's not much I did other than economics and uh, commerce. So I've decided to go with the finance stream and uh, worked in the finance industries. So I started off as many others did, single equity analyst, and worked my way up to portfolio management. And I'm currently operating United Traders. And uh, for my personal investments, I operate under a family office. Very cool. So I guess one question that I, I have for that is did you just kind of fall into trading or um did you have some sort of aspiration to do something else crazy like being a chef or something or was it always just uh finance and economics uh race car so i was an amateur racer i did some track instructing and in the beginning, when I was about 14, 15 years old, I started racing cars on the track. And uh, it's an expensive hobby, so I had to learn mechanics. And I had sponsorships on parts, but not the mechanical side, so I had to learn it. And realistically, I really wanted to be a, uh, you know, like a Formula One driver, but that's not how it works. Usually they're groomed since they're like seven years old. So missed the boat on that one and also realized it's an expensive hobby. I've probably burned closer to like 30, 40, up to probably like 60K on uh, car parts. So then I realized, you know what, I need something that could fund my obsession with cars. And where else could you do that except in business, right? Everything's a business. So I'm like, hey, I can land on my feet. No doubt. Do you think you'd ever get back into it? Yeah, I still do. Uh, me and a couple of my buddies, we rent out the track for the day, so... We'll just take our cars, burn a couple of sets of tires, and you know get that itch off our system. Very cool. So I guess from there, um, I'll ask you, how did you specifically get into the trading side of finance? So for trading, um, I was working at a I, as an IA at the time. So I've seen a lot of my clients, and majority of them were wealthy, right? Back then, we had a saying, it's like, you never want to deal with lawyers. Doctors never pick up their phones. So most of my target clientele was always business owners. And the beauty of that position was I was able to talk to high net worth clients that are successful in what they do. And a lot of them had investments. So that's what was what kind of triggered me to follow along get into investments, and start young. Wow, so you kind of had like the eye in the sky on what all the wealthy people were doing. That must have been pretty cool. Yeah, and taking a look at their bank accounts doesn't hurt. Right? <laughs> no doubt. See where the money's flowing. Yeah. 
So uh, what were your goals when you first started trading? Um, goal was to be financially free. Like everyone else, it's, you know, bills suck. Being able to not have to worry about, you know, putting food on your table, your mortgage payment, you know, that was the goal. And, you know, at that time, it's like I wanted to retire <laughs> early, right? Um, and I realized something. And it's pretty simple. It's like, if I can turn a dollar into $2,000 in my lifetime, then I'll be financially free. I'll retire younger. And that's what my goal was. Well, I, uh, I think you've done pretty well in achieving that goal, uh, just from what I know about you. Um, but when you were first starting out, did you ever think that you would reach the level of success that you're currently at? And the mountain of knowledge that I know that you do have? Never. I didn't know that I would have to put in this much effort at first, you know, if I had known that. Um, I use this as a good, like, analogy. It's like, if I bought my level two CFA books, I would never have done level one. So, you know, I'm glad I took it one step at a time. And I never thought or even dreamed of being here where I am, you know, probably maybe like by my when I was like seven maybe like 60 70 years old there was one time actually where um I just started investing it was in 2008 Apple went up for me and I was up like almost 300 percent and obviously I pulled out a compound interest chart and I'm like I'm gonna be a billionaire by 25 and uh <laughs> that's not that wasn't realistic at all but that was a dream just never thought I'd actually attain it. Wow, so cool to hear that. And uh, it's super inspirational for um, newer traders in the market like myself. Um, so you were talking a bit about Apple and uh, how you kept compounding that early on. Um, was that the only kind of early move that you made on in your career? Or was there um, some other focuses that you had uh, when you first started trading? Yeah, so... You know, when you're working in the industry, we are restricted on what we can buy and sell and when we can buy and sell it, right? So it didn't make sense to have a large portfolio. So I just went with the top one. At the time, I had a really good financial planner, Andrew, um, and I asked him, well, I had $10,000 of student loans that I didn't use and didn't want to really give back at that time. And I asked him, I was like, hey, what can I do to make 5.5% annually, right? And that's when he just mentioned, he's like, oh, here's a slew of mutual funds. All of these can perform well over 5.5%. And I went through the prospectus and realized all of them had Apple listed as their top 10 holdings. So instead of just going with a mutual fund, giving back some of my profits, um, I decided to just uh, go in with Apple. So started with 10,000 student loan money and, uh, then it just gradually grew and then my timing was good just because, you know, I turned 18 at the time and Apple just started ripping. So that was probably the best outcome possible. So uh, it sounds like a whole lot of follow the money trail and, uh, you know, you'll find success eventually, huh? Yeah, it's amazing how... Uh, you know, simple <laughs> that trade was, but um, it did everything, right? It, it gave me the starting capital I needed to get into like Tesla. And um, later I bought like Yahoo and a couple other stocks. Very cool. Did you ever worry about losing that $10,000 and then how would you pay it back? Or were you pretty set at the time? At the time, I wasn't too worried. Um, I still had a savings. This was just money that I had to give back as long as I just made 5.5%. And I was okay. I mean, I was making regular payments towards my student loan anyway. So I just wanted it to cover the interest portion. Gotcha. So in, in terms of fundamentals and, um, you know, everything else, what sources of information, um, news events or anything do you find most useful when gathering information relating to your trades? So uh, I look for quantifiable drivers. So things that I can use to update my, my DCF model, something that will give me an edge over the market. So 
you know, one of the cool things about having access to like Bloomberg is you get to see what other analysts are modeling, what their expectations are, their assumptions. So you can kind of reverse engineer their model and see how yours compares to theirs. So one of the easiest methods that I do is just I look for something that they may not have priced in or maybe they priced in and it was just too too much value that they um you know kind of portrayed when um when the company's actually starting to decline like zoom for example right it's not realistic for zoom to have that type of you know revenue growth year over year especially because most of the customers that they got during the pandemic they already have them there's like i don't think there's many customers left that they can really monetize on so it's a lot of just determining the future outcome of the company and whether or not there's a gap somewhere that other um, hedge funds haven't found yet. Is that right? Yeah. So we lean heavily on sell side research, but for the most part, you want to try and find just a little edge above them, right? So if there's something that isn't easy to be priced in and it isn't priced in right away and it'll take an analyst an entire day to write a new report that gives me an edge of hey maybe i can get in before they start issuing sell-side research on this particular topic interesting so you know one thing that i've noticed at least in this market is everything is kind of very out there and out of whack um, do you think that fundamentals on a lot of these companies that are um, pumping and dumping repeatedly will ever catch up with them? Um, I believe in an efficient market. Um, when you take a couple handful of stocks, then that theory doesn't really work. But overall, in general, I think the market is efficient. The pump and dump type of tickers, you know, that's really more due to the increased retail presence and now we're not just having analysts and um, capital allocators that are just buying investments based on future value but you have a lot of retail investors that are buying based on a story the stocks story and what they're trying to accomplish without actually knowing the fundamentals behind it so you are going to get extreme moves on the upside and then of course you know uh, with retail trading there's a limit to how much capital they they have right and they can't expose too much so when things start coming down they're the ones that are most likely to take the losses cut the losses and you know it just exacerbates the downtrend as well so another question on those a lot of them tend to move uh, with momentum specifically, and they're volume driven. So if you were limited to using only four technical indicators um, when trading these sort of momentum stocks, which would you choose and why? Hands down, it's going to be RSI, volume, volume price analysis. And I like the Bollinger Band clouds that I uh, designed, which is using the three standard deviation and the two standard deviation Bollinger Band. The reason for that combo is you kind of get the, kind of like a bell curve, right? Using the Bollinger Bands, you get to see where price usually sets. And a three standard deviation move is, you know, supposed to be an extreme move, right? So that helps me with timing entries and exits. The RSI helps me to see if there's any divergence, if there's any hidden divergence where price looks like it could bounce here, but the RSI is signaling could go lower or vice versa. And the volume price analysis, like I think Anna Cooling's book was one of the best books that I've ever read when it comes to technical trading and using volume to really determine where the price action will go, right? Because volume usually precedes price. Very cool. And so on the fundamental or technical side, really, this one um, kind of works for both of them. Uh, do you have any specific um, like favorite setups that you've learned over the years that you want to impart on uh, our listeners today? Yeah, so I created my own 
trading strategy around how I trade reversal patterns and continuation patterns. Uh, but my favorite setups are going to be like the double bottoms, triple tops, triple bottoms, double, triple bottoms, and triple tops. I mean, <laughs> and probably continuation patterns like, you know, flag setups, um, rising wedge, pennants. Those tend to be my go to technical patterns that I like to trade around. Awesome. One thing that I actually learned uh, specifically from you um, is your entry points on those patterns. Um, I think that a lot of what people try to trade today are breakouts only. And something that you always taught me was there's no point in buying the breakout when you can just buy on support or sell on resistance and go short. Um, is there any reasoning behind that other other than you know just trying to find the best entry yeah so i like to take a proactive approach to trading so you know a lot of traders are reactive so we know a majority of the population are going to be buying the breakout so instead of trying to buy with them i like to buy earlier than them like anticipating that they're going to buy the breakout that way you get a better price usually your stop losses are a lot tighter. And if they are buying the breakout, then you get that extra little bit of alpha that, you know, if you bought at the same time as them, you wouldn't have generated, you know, more alpha than the rest. All right. I just like to circle back um, and ask you a question about life in general. It doesn't necessarily have to be trading related, but if you could meet yourself um, before you started trading 16, 17 years ago, what year, uh, wisdom would you impart on yourself? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think they're turning a dollar into 2000 rule. So, you know, the goal is financial freedom and to retire young, well, at least younger than your peers. Right. And uh, let's say you're 20 years old, you want to retire at 30. So that gives you Actually, you want to retire in 30 years, not not at 30. Yeah, so um, in 30 years, you want to retire, and you truly believe that you can turn a dollar into 2000 in your lifetime, which is reasonable because when I worked as an IA, most of my clients had sufficient capital to retire and still maintain their lifestyle in their 50s. Um, you just have to make an annualized compounded return of 28.8%. So... For 30 years, try to just target making 28.8. So I try and aim for like 30 percent plus. And if you truly believe that you can do it, don't spend your money. Um, I used to be a big spender, so you know I worked hard, thought I should play hard, and then I started switching up uh, my strategy by just taking a look at everything I spent, and I looked at the product. Let's say some Nike Jordans. I looked at the price and I'm like, will I be willing to pay 2000 times the price of the item? And if the answer is no, I leave it. So that was my turning point when I stopped spending the money that I was trying to be making and accumulating. And when I mean truly believe it's at that point, I don't think I truly believed I could get here to this point. So I just wanted to enjoy my life and realize there's a lot of money I left on the table by spending it, spending it on useless things, useless people, um, instead of just, you know, saving it for myself and doing what's right to get me to my goal. Very good. Out of those um, useless things, or, I mean, maybe not necessarily completely useless, but, um, what is like the biggest purchase that you think looking back on it now, you might not have purchased it, um, in today's mindset. I, it has to be my, I had an E36, um, supercharged BMW M3. It was beautiful. I had spent everything on it. Um, and, you know, it was track ready. I blew a couple engines, so I'm already on my third engine. 
by the third engine, I realized that I have to like beefing up the internals a bit. So I went with like forged internals, you know, titanium pistons, rods. It's just like I went overboard on uh, on that car. So that was probably the worst thing I did because six months after the car was built, everything was done. Like I had a wish list of items that I wanted to uh, put on the car and slowly I did. After it was done, I just got bored of it. And six months later, I bought the M5. And uh, I actually gave away that E36, the M3, because just didn't have a parking space living in Toronto and uh, didn't have any use for it. Well, it sounds like me and you have a lot of the same issues. Um, I think that uh, when you're constantly shooting for goals and always meeting those goals, uh, they kind of become uh, less than they were hyped up to be. Is that right? That's right. Awesome. So, you know, it takes a lot of work and commitment to build, um, you know, such success like you have. And one thing that I think that um, is unlike anything that I've ever experienced is United Traders. Um, you know, the Discord group, the community of people that you have built. Um, so I just wanted you to talk about uh, what prompted you to start United Traders and what encourages you to continually build upon it? Um, so I got lucky. You know, I found what I really wanted to do, what I love to do early on. You know, a few people get to do that. And, you know, a ton of my friends, they didn't really, they don't really love what they do. Just a job, it pays the bills. They just continue to do it. And uh, for me, it just turned out that I was good at it so when I quit my finance job I still wanted to work with like-minded individuals that saw the benefit of working as a team because you know most of my growth was because of the peers that I was around and having that shark mentality everyone is working the longest hours not being forced to but because we had to and Having that environment really helps with your personal development. So I was looking at a couple trading groups. And at that time, I was teaching my girlfriend how to trade as well. And we're just looking through some and some are just horrendous. They were scalping pennies on penny stocks, inconsistent gains, always late on entries. And, you know, I was like, hey, we could do this better we should provide a service that actually will get people money. And the way that most people have, right? Um, if you take a look at the Forbes 500 list or, you know, Bloomberg's um, billionaires list, you'll kind of see that majority of the individuals are either business owners. Um, they have huge companies that were either brought down to them through generations or companies that they started themselves. And the second type were investors. And no matter what type of person they are, 80% of the guys on that list had one thing in common. They all had equity. Their largest investment was equity. So I started wanting to teach people, hey, the benefit of investing, of compounding. And luckily, I got um, a nice group. I think we have about 23,000 members now and uh, going strong. And they love my wisdom. And Indeed, we do. Um, so, you know, United Traders being such a large community um, and you and your search of personal development and growth, uh, what stands out to you um, of the things that you have learned by creating this group of people? Was there anything specific that you um, didn't foresee before you made this group that uh, you now use today in your everyday life? Oh, that's a good question. Honestly, there's a lot of people that helped me in the group. That's kind of why I do you know, what I do and try to contribute as much as I can. Um, I've learned a lot from, honestly, a ton of members. Like I learned a lot about psychology from Tony, who's, um, discord handled spin trading, um, a lot about tape reading from Tim, 
his Discord handles, Tape Reader, uh, Macro Views from DJ Alleyman, Market Structure from Kit, you know, Scalping from Dre, Biotech Valuations from Biobucks, you know, Forensic Analysis from guys like Mark, our research team, um, Growth Hunting from Greedy. And I think the most valuable, like, lessons and the most valuable um, impact that the groups made was probably from CFA 312. Um, that's his Discord handle. He's, he really works on the side in the back end, so don't really get to see him much. But, you know, he got me into SaaS stocks back in, I believe it was 2017, 2018-ish, and it completely changed my portfolio. I was a tech investor but I never really focused on an industry like SaaS and that was game changing. That really helped me grow my portfolio more than anything else, I guess. So what about it uh, was so game changing for you? The margins, right? Most businesses um, in other industries, other sectors, they operate at low margins. Uh, they have high cost uh, businesses, right? For example, banks, they have to have a retail presence, right? So they're going to have locations everywhere. Most of them are leased, but some of them are also bought. And that's a lot of capital that's being tied up and also expenses, right? A lot of overhead costs versus something like SaaS stocks where it's, uh, you know, software as a service. You can have a couple locations instead of, you know, a hundred locations. You can have people working remotely. You're overhead costs are going to be lower, which means your profits are going to be a bit higher. And with the new, you know, the system right now with everyone going with subscription models, you know, this is a really great type of industry to get into. Um, if you remember Adobe, right, before they went with subscription model, they used to have different Adobe products. And then every, I don't know, two or three years, you have to move to the next product, right? They'll have like CS3, CS4, and it just keeps going, right? So companies really had to be innovative and create a new product. And then they had to sell that new product, market the new product with the subscription model. They can just like make their product better and grow their business using that same product. And you probably have noticed this between like games, right? There's some people that love the old version of a specific game versus the newer version. So you're not going to run into that type of problem when you're constantly innovating the same software and selling it to the clients that actually need it and uh, growing, growing your customer base through that method. If you had one... SaaS stock out of all of them to buy right now for the rest of your life and never get rid of it. What, which one would it be? That's a tough one. Um, hands down, I gotta say like Adobe, it's, it's, they have a monopoly right now. You know, if you're a designer that hasn't, like I haven't met a designer that hasn't used Adobe that isn't familiar with the products, knows how to use it. So when you have such a strong brand that's built around, you know, designers, um, editors, like it's so hard for you to choose another product because you invested so much time and effort into learning that one specific product. So it's a sticky business model. I don't know how it looks on a chart right now. I'm not sure if I would add on to my Adobe position today, but it's definitely one that's at the very top of the list. Agreed. I actually use a lot of their products and I have um, for video editing and whatnot. So I definitely agree with that. So uh, in, in terms of the overall market right now, what is your current sentiment? I know I've been hearing a lot about uh, everybody else, but I wanted to hear it straight from the dragon's mouth, if you would. Um, and, you know, how do you view market dynamics currently compared to in the past? Oh, that's a good question. Um, how much time do we got? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of moving parts, so it's it's really hard. Um, 
to really just pinpoint what can cause the market to move up or down. But currently, you know, we're expecting some tapering from the Fed. And that's actually normal. That's been going on. It's just part of the economic cycle. Um, and it's good for the economy. Now, the market and the economy don't really align. You te- the market you, uh, sorry, the market tends to be about, I'd say around 16 months ahead of the economic cycles. So right now we're just preparing for what's next, which um, if you take a look at the numbers, we're expecting to have rates increasing by the second half of 2022 and then onwards. This is something that is good for the economy. It's good for the market, I mean, country uh, overall, but a lot of the bigger businesses, uh, actually a lot of the equities that we trade, right, they have a substantial benefit of having low rates. And in a low rate environment, it makes sense for businesses. But uh, like I mentioned before, right, there's some industries that are operating at such low margins. Like, I mean, slim, there's some that are at like 1%, 3% margins, right, net margin. So those companies are going to struggle while the companies that are like the SaaS stocks that have a bit of cushion room, they're going to actually excel. And they have already been using this uh, to their advantage. And we see it in the marketplace and why the tech industry is much, you know, bigger than uh, most of the other industries. So that's something that's going to come into play as analysts start modeling out higher rates and the implications of those higher rates on the companies that don't really have that cushion room. Secondly would be the Evergrande um, or Evergrande situation right now. Um, we were, our research team was actually looking into it last night. We were looking into their books. They do have sufficient cash. They have sufficient cash flow to pay off all their debt. And again, a good chunk of their of the uh, bond maturities aren't actually happening until second half of 2022 so they do have some time in their favor they are doing some asset sales and i think the media is just kind of you know overblowing the situation now what it can harm is obviously going to be the banks the ibs that invested in those bonds right because if you take a look at the majority of funds out there right uh, global bond funds are one of the highest, I mean, there's pension funds in it, there's uh, mutual funds, ETFs, there's a ton of money that's in the global bond industry. The problem is there isn't a lot of quality bonds able to be purchased at any given time. So as a capital allocator, you're restricted to certain countries, certain industries. And even if we take a look at something like EEM, you know, majority of EEM I'd say not majority, I'd say at least 30% is focused on China. So you're going to get situations where, yeah, they might default, but that risk is more targeted towards those funds. And yes, we can have a rippling effect, but I don't think it's something that is going to be, it's going to cause like a sustained downtrend, Uh, but it could act as a catalyst, which we're all waiting for, right? We know tapering's on the table. We know that the rates are going to go up and maybe this is that one part, that one thing that we needed to kind of, you know, burst the bubble. So it's funny that you're now talking about a catalyst after that question, um, which actually leads into my next, you know, remark. So it sounds like this is a very, very complex issue. And I know a lot of the bear case right now is, um, you know, there is all these complex issues with supply chains, Evergrande, the debt ceiling. Um, and then, you know, the bear or the bull case is that all this stuff has kind of just been priced in, you know, tapering has been priced in. Um, Evergrande was a big flop and there's a lot of people that believe we're just going to chug on all the way to all time highs. Um, however, I, I guess the real question here is, do you think that the markets have to have a catalyst in order to 
come down and have like a 15 to 20 percent correction or is that something that could just happen because that's where the market wants to go i mean i think the market always takes control and gets uh, their way when it comes to policies and any any type of economic change um the market kind of holds the economy hostage at certain points and um, sometimes the market just goes up a bit too high and I think a reversion to a mean is always healthy. It gives opportunities for allocators to get into picks and not be in a situation like we are that we have in um, with Evergrande, right, where allocators didn't have much options but to go with certain bonds because that's where they found the alpha. So I think it's healthy. I think it's needed. And personally, I might be biased on it since uh, a nice pullback would be great right now for another pick up on some of the stocks that i'm looking at do you think that's the way that we're headed we're gonna move on down into this uh 10 to 15 percent correction do you think now is the time or potentially this might just be a big flop and then it'll happen three months from now um seasonality wise usually this tends to be the weaker area like a quarter in the market right this is where we usually have a pullback so you know trying to time it around this area seems reasonable Um, if you take a look at VIX there are a lot of speculators that are positioning themselves with an edge so I think it's it's due for a slight correction I'm not sure about 20 percent 10 percent would be nice and uh, that'll leave some room again for people like us to uh, buy some stocks that we might have missed or stocks that I sold too early on the last correction. Very good. So this past Monday, um, I believe the total outflows were totaling around $11 billion. Um, What are your thoughts on that? Because I don't think that I've seen uh, an outflow that large for quite a while. Yeah. um, You know, we saw Mike Wilson on Bloomberg and he was mentioning a 20% correction, his ideas on why uh, that would be good. I think it's expected. I think a lot of the allocators already knew this was coming. It's just part of, you know, late cycle uh, recovery. So I think we're um, okay with it. I think in terms of the market itself, we're, we're on the fence on when it should happen. But I think we all agree that a good correction is okay. And honestly, what other time frame um, would you want a correction, right? Because remember back in 2018, um, Feds increased rates and, you know, we had a 20% drawdown into um, the end of December, right? When most people are with their families, uh, most of us were at our seats trying to see if we could buy the dip or if it's just going to continue to dip, right? So I think this is a nice time period. People coming back from the Hamptons, this is the time to kind of hit the market and get the recovery going for that Santa rally. I totally agree on that one. So what do you think the best way to manage yourself during these correctionary periods is? Do you take off some time and then, you know, don't look at charts and then come back and reevaluate or do you tend to lean in more and have an eye on everything that's going on during these corrections i lean in more so i like to double down on my efforts uh, when the markets are weaker and when the markets are strong i don't really do much activity i'll switch to shorter term trades just to keep my mind busy and you know, scratch that itch. um, And I'll let my portfolio do what it's designed to do. In terms of corrections, that's where I'm a bit more involved. So tighter stop losses, I'll use trailing stops. um, If I have a position that's over 15% um, on the upside, then I'll start using like 11% um, trailing stops. So I'll start tightening tightening up uh, stop losses, which on certain positions, I don't really have stop losses since my portfolio holds uh, well over 100 different tickers. Um, One stock really doesn't make a meaningful difference anymore. So 
it's not going to be the end of the world if one or two stocks, um, you know, crashes. Um, it's more about looking at the overall portfolio and how the performance is on that portfolio and just tracking the fundamental drivers of, you know, whichever stock it is and uh, deciding on what I should allocate to or which ones I should allocate out of based on that. So a diverse portfolio is key during these times, would you say? Yes. You know, I like to keep the guys that are, you know, cash flow positive, the ones that are profitable businesses, you know, positive EPS, uh, stocks that are at a good, you know, relative valuation um, versus its peers. Um, The stocks that are high, high valuation, those are the ones that are on the top of my list. And I keep a watch list of the ones that aren't profitable, that aren't, you know, have like horrible FCF or OCF and the ones that have horrible margins, those are at the top of the list. So when a pullback happens, those are the ones that I usually start to scaling out, start to scale out of knowing that they're the ones that should be impacted more on a fundamental basis. And when you do end up getting those opportunities during these corrections to add on to positions or open new ones, what type of um, stocks do you jump towards first? The top stocks. So if we have a major correction, the ones that usually tend to move up the fastest are going to be your mega caps. So I'm going to be buying leaps on things like Amazon, Facebook, Apple, uh, might do Baba depends on how you know the regulatory environment is with uh, China right now, but uh, those are on the top of the list. And also EA games. I think um, we were looking at the gaming industry uh, during our research team meetings, and one thing I noticed was for the gaming industry, a lot of them are not performing well, or their forecasts are just not that great. Um, so we looked at Activision. Ubisoft, EA, TTWO, and, you know, EA seemed to be the best out of the bunch. So doing some more research on that to uh, kind of take advantage of the gaming sector overall. Uh, Corsair is something that's always been on my watch list. You know, we bought this at IPO. So for me, it's one that I've already already made money on uh, countless times. So with the total addressable market increasing um, in the gaming industry at around 12%, 13% CAGR. Um, I'm expecting some of that money to flow down to Corsair and, of course, EA. That's some very valuable insight. Um, so going back more towards the um, United Trader side of things, you know, you've mentored and helped so many people during the time that you've had United Traders, but what are some of um, your mentors, um, academics, kings of industries, authors or creators, um, et cetera? Ooh, I got a lot. Um, There's a lot of people that have helped me out in my journey and some of them from different aspects of life, right? Um, I had a used car dealership. I was operating that. And at that time, I learned a lot about the industry, but also, you know, sales, what what matters to customers or consumers, right? Um, in school, you know, you know, purchasing behaviors of uh, individuals and, you know, that type of knowledge was, was essential for what I do right now. Um, in terms of mentors, there's a ton. Um, you know, some are professors, some are still working in the industry, so they probably don't want to be named. But, uh, you know, there's one of my biggest mentors is a bond trader. He was the one that really um, mentored me when I was an IA. He was one of my clients. And, you know, he he said this one line, he's like, if you don't count your pennies, you don't deserve your dollars. And coming from a bond trader, that seemed like appropriate at the time. And, uh, it was only when I was trying to book him. So I called my FX desk and I'm trying to book him a, a currency conversion. And he was really upset by a 0.02% difference in um, the exchange rate. And I was like, wow, that's like not a lot. He, he wasn't converting a lot either. And mind you, it was like less than $500,000. And like, this was something that 
he didn't like and then he wanted me to call them again and uh that taught me a lot about hey you know don't just take no for an answer try your best to kind of work on saving as much money as you can right because i think there's two sides of the equation it's not just how much you make but also how much you save so he taught me that valuable lesson on top of his experience as a trader so that really resonated well for me uh one of my mentors you know she was the best boss in the world and she's the boss that everybody wanted few people deserved and honestly i'd like learned a lot about her management style and and how she just held herself up and her team up so really value that experience that i gained from her um a few other individuals would be like futures traders uh that i know um and an economist that guided me who was more of a mentor throughout my career and um got me into the positions that i really wanted to while uh, while she was moving up the ranks um i got to kind of follow her follow along with her awesome tj it's you know it's so cool to hear um the other side of you because whenever i think of um you know the top of the line or really the the kings of the industry i tend to think towards you and it's it's very interesting to hear um you know who you look up to as well and who, who you have learned from um that has led you to this point but um unfortunately i think we are running down on time so any closing remarks that you have um not much just you know if you guys really want to do this just believe in yourself and uh save as much money don't try to you know over leverage don't try and put too much capital into a single trade um you have to work harder before your money starts working harder for you very good thank you so much tj unfortunately that's all the time we have for today i'd like to thank all of the people behind the scenes and our production crew as well as our esteemed guest uh, for their hard work and dedication as always it's been great to have you and we'll see you next time Thank you.